uh, in this class, we are going to talk about inventories. Specifically, we are going to talk about, first of all, how to calculate the cost of inventories. Uh, the cost of inventory depends on the cost flow method the firm uses. Uh, and then we're going to talk about something called lower of cost called net realizable value. So if you still remember from last class, when we talk about sales, whenever the firm sold something, there are two general entries the firm make. The second one is to record the cost of goods sold. The general entry is to debit cost of goods sold, credit inventory. And in the example we gave in the previous class, uh, the cost of goods sold was just given to you. However, in practice, uh, the cost of goods sold actually needs to be determined. And the question is, how much, how do we determine dollar amount to record for the cost of goods, for the cost of goods sold? So what is the dollar amount to record here? And in order to determine the dollar amount to record for cost of goods sold, we need to first determine the quantity of goods that has been sold. So we first determine the quantity and then we determine what cost is associated with each, with each quantity that was sold. Then we can get the total cost of goods sold. So uh, with regard to how to determine the quantity uh, of inventory, the equation here is the beginning inventory plus the number of inventory that has been purchased minus the number of inventory that has been sold equals to the ending inventory. So suppose that you have two units of inventory at the beginning, you purchased three, you sold one, how much do you have left? You have four left. So this is just basic math. And then uh, when we're determining the quantity of inventory, uh, we need to take two steps. The first step is a physical count of inventory. This is when the firm is using periodic inventory system. Uh, they don't know how much inventory they have sold. So they have to do a physical count that they counted. Hey, we have four inventory, four units of inventory that is left at the end of the month, which means that we must have sold one piece of inventory. So physical count. And then the second step, is to determine the ownership of goods. Uh, this step is important because sometimes the inventory you counted at a firm's place may not be exactly the number of inventory the firm actually owns. So uh, a couple of factors may complicate this issue and we're going to talk about it in a minute. But first of all, let's look at the physical count of inventory. What is a physical count? The definition of physical count is we counting, weighing, um, weighing, measuring each kind of inventory on hand. So it's basically we at the end of the financial reporting period, we go into the firm to count like how many inventory the firm has. So this is physical count. And then we need to determine the ownership of goods. The ownership of goods. So the physical count help us to determine the number of inventory the firm has on hand. This is achieved by physical count. However, the number of inventory the firm own doesn't need to be equal to the number of inventory the firm on hand. Uh, this is because sometimes the firm may have some inventory that it owns, but not on hand. And sometimes the firm may have some inventory on hand, but not own. So you may be wondering, uh, how can this happen? So first of all, let's look at the firm may have inventory on, but not on hand. So what kind of goods uh, made the firm own, but not on hand? And this is mostly caused by the goods in transit. So when the goods is being on transit, is on the way from the seller to the buyer, you are not going to see this good either at the buyer's place or at the seller's place. So if you do a physical count, either at the buyer's place or, or on the, in the seller's place, you're not going to see this good at all because this good is on the way from the buyer, to, from the seller to the buyer. So uh, in this situation, if the firm has purchased something, but they have not received it, or the firm has sold something, but that is not delivered. Um, and the, both of those situations, those goods may be if the firm has ownership of that good, 
it needs to be counted as to, as the firm's inventory, even though you are not going to see it in the firm's warehouse or anywhere at the firm's place. Uh, and then, so uh, if the firm has legal title to the good, they should be included in the inventory of the good. And then the question is, how do we know whether the firm has legal title to this good, which is in transit? Uh, we need to look at the shipping terms. If you still remember this from last class, depends on whether it's FOB shipping point, point or FOB destination. Uh, if it, it is FOB shipping point, this good in transit, it belongs to the buyer. So, and then if it is FOB destination, this good, which is in transit, belong to the seller. Uh, this is uh, if, um, if the good is in transit, uh, and we should pay attention to this situation to count the firm's inventory when determining how much, what is the quantity of inventory the firm owns. And the other situation is sometimes the firm may have some inventory on hand, but those are not the firm's inventory. An example is consigned goods. So for example, sometimes you go to a dinner, you may see a lot of cars on the dinner's parking lot. But those cars actually they don't belong to the dinner. Dinner is just selling it for someone else, and uh, in return, dinner is collecting a fee. But they don't have ownership of those cars, uh, and this is an example of consigned goods. And again, in this situation, the firm doesn't have legal title to those goods, so they should not include those goods in its inventory. So we have talked about how to determine the quantity of inventory. Um, now let's talk about how to determine the cost of those inventory. How to calculate the inventory cost. The formula is very similar to the pre previous one. So in the previous one, we talked about the beginning inventory plus purchase. And in this situation, purchase fry in, uh, if it, the firm use periodic inventory system, purchase fry in purchase return and allowance, purchase discounts. So all of those are counted as associated with the purchase activity minus the cost of goods sold. So this is basically the cost of the goods that has been sold and equals to the cost of the end inventory. And this part, beginning inventory plus purchase plus fried in minus purchase return uh, and annoyance minus purchase discount. So this part, this is called cost of goods available for sale. And this cost of goods available for sale is divided between cost of goods sold and the cost of ending inventory. How it is divided, how it is divided depends on the cost flow assumption the firm uses. And what is cost flow assumption? We're going to talk about it in a minute. So um, another thing I want to mention here is, so here in this class or in this chapter, uh, we are mostly interested in the periodic inventory system. Uh, in the previous class, the general entries, uh, we are mostly interested in the perpetual inventory system. The periodic, that's something additional. However, in this chapter, what we're talking about here, those are mostly for the periodic inventory system. Uh, we're also going to talk about perpetual inventory system as well, but uh, most of the illustration here, those are for the periodic. So, uh, so what, what is the cost flow method and how does it link to the cost of goods sold and cost of the end inventory? Uh, here's an example. So suppose me, I run a bakery on campus and my bakery, I sell apple pie in my bakery. Uh, suppose me, this example is a periodic one. So at the beginning of the day, before I even open my bakery, uh, I looked at my fridge and I have two apple pies in my fridge. Those apple pies are purchased yesterday at $20 each. So in total, the cost of those two apple pies are $40. And then uh, before I open the bakery, I go and bought three additional apple pies. 
And the cost for those three additional apple pies, those are $30 each. So the total cost for those three apple pies, those are $90. So how much apple pie do I have available for sale uh, before I open the bakery? I have five apple pies, so two plus three. Um, and the cost of those five apple pies, so how much is the cost for those four, five uh, apple pies I have available for sale? Uh, we have 40 plus 90, so that's $130. And this is called cost of goods available for sale. So which is the cost of those five apple pies that I have available for sale? And then uh, I opened a bakery. I did one days of business and I was able to sell four apple pies. How, how many apple pies do I have left? I have one apple pie left. Uh, and then the questions for our content is to determine the cost of those four apple pies and the cost for this one apple pie. The cost for those four, four apple pies that I have sold, that is called cost of goods sold. And the cost for this one apple pie that I have left is called the cost of the end inventory. So how do I determine the cost of goods sold and cost of the end inventory? It depends on the assumption I'm making here. So I sold four apple pies, but what apple pies are they? Suppose they, uh, I have apple pies numbered one, two, three, four, five. And suppose they, the four apple pies I sold, I can specifically identify those apple pies to whether it is apple pie number one or apple pie number two. Uh, then it is called specific identification method. So suppose I was able to identify, so the ones I sold, that is apple pie number one, number two, number three, and number five. And the cost for apple pie number one, that's $20. The cost for apple pie number two, that's $20. Cost for apple pie number three, that is $30. And cost for a number five is $30. So the total cost is $100 under specific identification method. And this is called specific identification method. Uh, and supposedly, yeah, another situation, uh, I'm look at these four apple pies and I decide to make the assumption that those four apple pies, I'm going to use my old inventory first. And then after I have used those the first in first uh, first in first out the first inventory i have purchased if i have you after i have used those inventories i'm going to move on to the inventory i purchased later so which means that i'm going to first use out the two apple pies from the beginning inventory and then i'm going to use the two apple pies that i sold later is going to come out from the apple pie i purchased at the beginning of today so that is $20 each from the first inventory. And then I have two apple pies left. I'm going to use the $30 unit cost, which is coming from the apple pies I purchased later. So this is going to give us $100. So here, this, in this example, it's just by coincidence that a uh, specific identification method is giving us the same uh, cost of the sold as, as FIFO first in, first out, but it doesn't happen all the time. So this is just by coincidence that those two numbers are the same. And supposedly I can also make some other assumptions. Uh, those four apple pies, I can also assume that those apple pies are coming, I'm going to first use out the apple pies I just freshly purchased uh, at the beginning of the day today. And then after I have used up those three apple pies, I'm going to move to the apple pie I have left at the uh, end of yesterday. So I first use out three apple pies that I purchased at the beginning of today at $30 each. And then the last apple pie, I'm going to take it from the fridge yesterday, which I purchased at $20 each. And this is going to give us the cost of those four apple pies. Now it's going to become 110. And then I can also make an assumption that 
those five apple pies, no matter whether they're purchased yesterday or they're purchased today, they are just identical apple pies. So I take $130 and divide it by five. Each apple pie, what is the unit cost for each? And I multiply by four. So I sold four apple pie out of this five. And this is going to give us 100, 104, which is the cost of those four apple pie I have sold. So as you can see here that under different assumptions, I'm going to get different cost of the good that has been sold. Very similarly for the cost of the any inventory, if I use specific identification method, the apple pie that is going to be left is apple pie number four. And the cost for that apple pie is $30. If I use FIFO first in first out, I first used up these two apple pies, and then I used up two of the, those three apple pie. So I have one apple pie left. The, this apple pie left is going to come from the ones I purchased uh, right before, so the my latest purchase, which is $30 each. So this is under FIFO. And under NIFO, what is this apple pie that has left? At first, I have already used up this three. So the apple pie that is left is coming from my old purchase, which I purchased at $20 each. And versus average cost, uh, I average the cost of those five apple pies and take one. So that is $26. So again, the cost of any inventory is also going to be different. Depends on what kind of assumption we make. And specific identification, five or nine for average cost that we have just mentioned, those are called cost flow assumptions. Uh, specific identification method in the book, they, they are trying to separate it from the cost flow assumption. But if you look at some other book, or if you go to an intermediate financial accounting, or if you're going to take CPA in the future, they all classify it. It is just one kind of cost flow assumption. So you can just view it the same as five or nine for average cost. Uh, and under different cost flow assumption, as we just illustrated, we're going to get different cost of goods sold and different cost of the end inventory. But the actual physical flow of goods doesn't need to change. So as you see here that the flow of goods is the same. It's just depending on the assumption we make, the, the, we're assuming different costs associated with the goods we have sold. This is going to give us different cost of goods sold and different cost of the ending inventory. So now let's look at an example here. The beginning at the beginning, we have six units at eight dollars each, and then we sold three units. We purchased four units at nine dollars each. And then we sold two units. So uh, depending on which cost flow assumption the firm makes, and depending on whether it's perpetual or periodic inventory system, please determine the, please uh, calculate the cost of the sold and cost of the end inventory under each. Um, we haven't really talked about perpetual inventory system yet, uh, but we're going to talk about it in a minute. But for now, please take five minutes. Try, try to figure out the answer on your own. So as you can see here that this is actually uh, uh, three by two. So nine four. FIFO average cost, and we can have perpetual or periodic. So it may give you different answers for each. Uh, please take five minutes, work on this example on your own first.
So the first one is nitro perpetual. Uh, nitro perpetual, not in first out, and it is perpetual. So what does it mean for us? Uh, first of all, let's look at the cost of goods sold for nitro perpetual. If it is a perpet the firm keep perpetual record of its cost of goods sold. So let's look at, first of all, the firm on January 5th, the firm, the firm sold three units and NIFO. So what is the cost for those three units? Those are $8 each. And then the firm, so after the firm has sold these three units, now the firm has three units left at $8 each. And then the firm purchased four units at $9 each. And now the firm sold two other units. These units, if the firm used NIFO, nothing first out, it must come from this ones the firm has just purchased. So we sold another two at $9 each. So the cost of goods sold here is $42. And what is the cost of the end inventory? For the ending inventory, we have three units left from the beginning inventory, which is $8 each. And then for these four units, we sold two units. So we have two units left at $9 each. And this is going to give us 42 as well. So this is nine for perpetual cost of goods sold, 42 cost of Ending inventory 42. Uh, and now let's look at what, what about NIFO periodic? So if uh, the firm has using NIFO periodic inventory system, uh, the firm has a beginning inventory of six units. So beginning inventory is six. And then the firm uh, purchased four inventory during the period. The firm sold five. So the firm has five left at the end of the financial reporting period. And then uh, because the firm doesn't, care how much it has sold during the period. And at, so at the end of the financial reporting period, these five units cost of goods sold, the firm first take them out from the four units, which was just purchased. And then the last one is taken out from the units the firm has at the beginning of the financial reporting period. So that gives us a cost of goods sold of 44. And the cost of the ending inventory is the five units the firm has at the beginning of the financial reporting period multiplied by eight. So that's $40. So under NIFO periodic, the cost of goods sold is 44. And the cost of ending inventory is 40. So that is under NIFO. How about average cost? Under the average cost inventory system. So first of all, the firm sold three and the cost for those three is $8. So cost of goods sold, three multiplied by eight. And then after the firm sold this three, the firm has three units left at $8 each. And then the firm purchased four at $9. So what is the total cost now? The total cost is three multiplied by eight plus four multiplied by nine. And then this is divided between three plus four, seven units. So the unit cost for that one is uh, after this purchase is going to be 8.57. And then the firm sold another two out of this seven. 
So we multiply it by two. So the total cost of goods sold is 42.85. So the cost of goods sold is 42.85. And the cost of the end inventory. So we have two inventory. Uh, we have actually five inventory. Out of this seven, we sold two. So we have five left multiplied by 8.57, which is the unit cost here. So that is going to give us 42.85. Oh, sorry, the previous cost of goods sold is, forty one point one four. And the cost of the ending inventory is 42.85. So this is under average cost perpetual. And how about under the average cost periodic? Under average cost periodic, uh, we don't care uh, what is happening during the period. So we only care that at the end of the financial reporting period, we have sold five and we have five left. So the cost of goods sold is, uh, we have the beginning inventory, six multiplied by eight, plus we have purchase four multiplied by nine, divided by the number of items that is available for sale, and we sold five. Uh, and then we have five left. So the cost of goods sold here is, uh, this is going to give us, 42, and the cost of ending inventory is going to be, so this, the unit cost is 8.2. So the end inventory will also have five units left. And then each unit is, uh, have the unit cost of 8.2. So 8.2, uh, sorry, 8.4. So 8.4 multiplied by five, that is going to give us 42 as well. So this is average cost periodic. And the last one is FIFO perpetual and FIFO periodic. FIFO perpetual first in first out. So under the perpetual inventory system, the first three cost of goods sold for the first three items, that's $8 because first in first out. And after that, we have three left. And then for the nature two item that has been sold, we, we first take it, even though the firm purchase another four nature, but we still take it from the beginning inventory because we haven't used it up yet. So two multiplied by eight. Uh, so this is going to give you $40. And the cost of ending inventory so we have, uh, after we have sold this two, we still have one unit left from the beginning inventory at $8 each. And we have four units left, which was just purchased at $9 each. And this is going to give us $44. So this is five for periodic. And five for perpetual, so under FIFO perpetual, we only do a physical count at the end of the financial reporting period. And we know that we have sold five, we have five left. And for this five we have sold, we first take them out from the beginning inventory. So which is $8 each. Cost of the sold is $40. And we have five left. We, uh, one of each comes from the beginning inventory, $8. And the other four is coming from the inventory we have just purchased. So the cost of ending inventory is going to be 44 as well. And you may notice here that under FIFO, your cost of goods sold and cost of ending inventory, is going to be the same no matter the firm use is a uh, perpetual or periodic inventory system. So the cost of goods sold is the same, cost of any inventory is the same. And this happens for FIFO. 
as long as the firm is using FIFO, it doesn't matter whether the firm is using perpetual or periodic, it's going to give you the same numbers. However, it's not going to happen for NIFO at an average cost. So this is something to pay attention to. And now uh, we have talked about how to calculate cost of goods sold and cost of end inventory. Uh, let's do a comparison of FIFO and NIFO. So under FIFO and NIFO, if the purchase price is increasing, which one is going to give you a higher cost of goods sold, FIFO or NIFO? The NIFO is going to give you a higher cost of goods sold because under NIFO, nothing first out, higher cost goes out. So the cost of goods sold is going to be higher versus FIFO, first in, first out, the cost of goods sold is going to be lower. And then because cost of goods sold is higher in the NIFO, the gross profit, which is the difference between sales revenue and cost of goods sold, it's going to be lower. And because gross profit is going to be lower, so your income tax is going to be lower. And cost of the ending inventory, because under NIFO, nothing first out, the higher cost goes out. So what is left is the lower cost. So under NIFO, the cost of the ending inventory is going to be lower. Uh, and then similarly, if the price falls, cost of goods sold under NIFO is going to be lower because nothing first out, the lower cost goes out. And gross profit is going to be higher. Income tax is going to be higher. And, but your cost of the end inventory is going to be higher as well under NIFO. So this is a comparison of NIFO and FIFO. And NIFO and FIFO, they both have their advantage and disadvantage. The major advantage of using FIFO is, uh, it is because it's first in, first out. So uh, the, it, it leaves the most recent cost in the end inventory because the, the old cost has gone out. So what is left, the cost that has been left in the end inventory, that is the most recent cost. And so that it produces a better measure of the cost of the end inventory versus NIFO because the nothing first out. So it puts the most recent cost into the cost of goods sold so that it produces a better matching of the revenue and the cost of goods sold, and they produce a better measure of the firm's net income. Uh, and because under FIFO, first in, first out, the better cost goes into the end inventory. So the old cost goes into the cost of goods sold, it resulting in a poor match of revenue and cost of goods sold. And for the NIFO, because the nothing first out, the most meaningful recent cost goes into the cost of goods sold. So what is left in the cost of the end inventory is the old cost. So it results in a uh, not so good measure of the cost of the end inventory. So those are some advantage and advantages and disadvantages of FIFO and NIFO. And there's something else. So under FIFO, if the purchase price is decreasing, the FIFO is going to yield uh, the lowest income tax. That is FIFO's advantage. And under NIFO, if the purchase price is increasing, NIFO is going to produce a lower taxable income. And that is NIFO's advantage. Uh, however, there's some other disadvantage of NIFO. So um, this is, we're going to talk about it in more advanced uh, financial accounting, actually um, intermediate financial accounting class. It's not required for this course. Uh, managers can actually manage earnings through something called NIFO liquidation. Uh, and then, um, so this is NIFO. It actually opens a small door for managers to manage its earnings. And this is why NIFO is not actually permitted under IFRS. It is permitted under the US GAAP but it's not permitted under the international financial reporting standards. Uh, so these are some advantages and disadvantages of FIFO and NIFO. And we just talked about how to calculate the cost of the end inventory under specific identification FIFO-NIFO average cost. 
And what we have been talking about here, the cost, those are historic cost. And there's a problem with historic cost. Uh, it may have little relationship with the real value of the assets. And let me give you, you an example here. So suppose we continue the previous apple pie example. And suppose I use NIFO to value my apple pie inventory. So under NIFO, the one apple pie I have left, it should be valued at $20 each. However, what if someone choked when eating my apple pie and no one's coming to buy my apple pie for two days? So maybe at the end of the week, I only find that I may only get $8 for this apple pie, which is a stale apple pie that I have left. So the question here is, does it still make sense to value this apple pie at $20? And the answer is probably not. This $8, that is called the net realizable value of the inventory. Uh, it is the estimated selling price minus any reasonable predictable cost of selling. So it is the selling price I can get from selling this apple pie. And to be conservative, firms are required to write down the inventory value when the net realizable, when the net realizable value drops below the historic cost. So in this example, the net realizable value is $8 and my historic cost is $20. So when it drops below the historic cost, firm needs to write down the inventory value. And the general entry we use to write down the inventory value is we debit either cost of goods sold or loss on write down and we credit inventory. And this rule of writing down the inventory cost, it is called lower of cost or net realizable value. And uh, for firms, so this is not required for this cost, but just for you to know, if the firm has been using NIFO or retail inventory method, um, this is not covered in this cost either. Uh, if you are interested, you are going to learn about it in intermediate financial accounting. But if the firm is using the NIFO or retail inventory method, the ending inventory is reported at lower of cost or market, which is different from lower of cost or net realizable value. Uh, and then, so specifically, this lower of cost or net realizable value, how to do it? We have two steps. The first step is to determine the net realizable value. And this is very easy. We have an estimated selling price and we have a cost of selling. So you take the difference between those two. 150 in this example is going to be your net realizable value. And the second step is to compare, compare it with the cost. So supposedly the cost of the end inventory is 180 and now your net realizable value is 150. So it is smaller than the cost, which means that we need to write down. How much do we need to write down? We need to write it down by $30. So we need to write the cost down to net realizable value by taking out $30 from the cost. And here's an example of the lower of cost or net, net realizable value. So we have those items the from half and the unit cost we have here. So this is determined by FIFO or NIFO average cost. And now we also have the net realizable value for each unit. So what we need to do here is for each unit, for example, for the flat screen TV, we compare the cost and net, net realizable value. And we find that the net realizable value is smaller. So we take the net realizable value. And for the second item, the cost is smaller. So we take the cost. The third item, the net realizable value is smaller. So we take the net realizable value. The third item, the cost is smaller. So we take the cost. And then based on this, we're able to calculate the, the value of the ending inventory. And this value is what it goes on to the firm's balance sheet. So it is not just the cost. It is not just a net realizable value. It's actually determined by a rule that compares the two and 
pick whichever is smaller. Uh, and this is the normal of cost or natural value. And this is all uh, I want to talk about for this class. <laughs>